Hey guys, this is Ken from Man Cave Effects. To multiple requests today, I will make the ultimate test. Can you engrave metal with a Chinese K40 laser? Well, first of all, how does a cutting laser even works? Well, there are three categories of lasers to be used for cutting and engraving. CO2 or gas lasers, fiber lasers, and jack or crystal lasers. Going into them all and to their principles will take uh, much space for now, so today we are only talking about gas lasers, such as the K40 is. In our case, the laser source of our K40 laser is a CO2 laser tube, which supposedly is rated about 40 watts. CO2 lasers are also industrially used to cut materials, such as uh, plastic, wood, steel and other metals. But sure, with other power ratings, uh, there we are talking about thousands of watts in some cases. But when the basic principle is the same, so is the K40 laser do anything to metal then? Let's first talk about with what method our laser functions. The K40 laser is based on the principle of vaporization cutting. The focused laser beam heats the surface of the material to its boiling point and generates a keyhole. The keyhole leads to a sudden increase in absorptivity, quickly deepening the hole. As the hole deepens, the material boils, vapor generated erodes the molten walls, blowing ejecta out and further enlarging the hole. Non-melting materials such as wood, uh, carbon uh, and uh, thermoset uh, plastics are usually cut this way. But to cut metal correctly with a CO2 laser, besides a lot of power, it would need another component high pressure gas that blows away material from the cutting area. That's why you often see sparks flying pretty far when steel gets cut by a laser. These gases, such as oxygen, can accelerate the cutting speed up to three times. Now, don't be confused about wattage in the first place. As I said, we are working with our CO2 laser with around 40 watts. A diode pump jack laser uh, could engrave metal already at 10 watts, as their principle works differently, so they are not comparable. Also, the way the laser beam gets onto your working piece is different. A cheap jack laser, for example, simply carries the whole laser source on its sled, while a CO2 laser tube is huge, so it uh, normally sits in the back of the machine and gets deflected by using mirrors into the cutting head. So it's like comparing tools. Uh, cheap tools of different brands are pretty much the same. They all get the job done somehow in a certain way. It depends what you need. If the screws are Phillips or slot headed, right? A Chinese diode jack laser machine would be the cheapest method. It can also cut other materials to a certain thickness, but has a quite small working area of about only 2 by 2 inches. A CO2 laser, on the other hand, can cut and engrave materials such as wood, cardboard, rubber and acrylic on a workbed that is uh, much, much larger. In case of the K40 laser, its size is even bigger than a sheet of printing paper. Also, it comes with a blower fan that evacuates fumes, and this thing can be upgraded with many things for small money to make the results even better. Me personally, in the $500 price range, I would always stay with my CO2 laser. So how awesome would it be if you even could engrave metal with it? Well, we will try it out today. Beforehand, I can tell you already, yes, there are actual ways to engrave metal with a K40 by adding some additional processes. But as for the extra work, I would not recommend doing this for like a uh, hundred business cards or something. It's more a process for an individual item as it takes some extra time. There are multiple ways of transferring or engraving logo designs or letters onto metal with a K40. There are pre-made plastic coated metal plates made for laser engraving that work nicely and are permanent. Ideal for making signs. The disadvantage is that you won't be able to cut them to size with your laser. So you need to order them to the right dimensions or you have to cut them down manually. Then there are laser marking sprays. A substance that sprays onto your metal piece and combines with the metal under high heat. After engraving with the laser, you simply wash off the excess paint under running water and you have a nice engraving or permanent print on your working piece. But those sprays are pretty expensive though around 60 to 70 bucks per can. So apparently there are homebrew recipes that uh, all uses some kind of dry lubricant spray as a main ingredient that contains molybdenum disulfate. Maybe I will cover this in a future video. Just leave me a comment below if you're interested. A very simple way of getting a proper metal transfer of a design is to mask off the metal sheet with some masking tape 
Then engrave your design, peel off the cutouts with an X-Acto knife and simply give it a coat with uh, some spray paint. Important is to wait until the paint is completely dried up. Then after carefully removing the masking tape you will have a nearly perfect reproduction on your final piece. The disadvantage is that uh, it is spray paint, so it's not engraved and it won't be permanently depending on the use. While I made pretty good experience with this method, even it is not suited for outdoor use. The advantage on the other side though is that um, it works on nearly any surface and you can choose from hundreds of colors. Then there is etching. That can be made by using acids or using electrolysis. While acids need a lot of precautions and safety gear besides of getting concentrated acids in the first place, electrolysis is a quite simple and a less dangerous way to permanently etch metal as long as you do this on a good ventilated place. And that's what I want to try out today. Now let's start off with a general test here. I have five different metals. I've got a sheet of brass, copper, aluminum, aluminum foil and a bar of carbon steel. I want to test if I can get any trace of engravement at all with my K40 laser. So first I need to wash and polish the sheets down to get rid of uh, any residue, dirt and oils by using a fine sand paste and soap. You sure could use steel wool and soap as well. Then I make a simple design in Coral Laser. In this case I just use my channel logo that is black filled all the way to have a maximum of laser penetration on the metal. Also I turned down the engraving speed by around 50% and powered my laser up to a maximum. Then I give every metal a single pass. As I was guessing, the laser could not do anything at all to the copper, uh, such as to the brass. High reflective metals are even harder to cut or penetrate. Another reason you need high power lasers is uh, the conductivity of the metal. Metal deflects heat. We use metal heat shields for cooling electronic components to evacuate heat. The same thing happens when the hot laser beam hits the surface of the metal. The heat just spreads out right away. No penetration on the aluminum sheet neither. It could not even do something to the aluminum foil. Most of the beam simply got reflected. But wait a second, is this... The carbon steel actually has some kind of engraving. But uh, nope, uh, it was only the oxide layer uh, or contamination that didn't came off uh, while scrubbing it with soap. You can simply rub it off again. Well, okay, that result was kind of predictable, but now we know finally. Let's try etching those materials with electrolysis. Therefore I need to mask off the sheets where I want the engraving. As electrolysis is based on water, I use plastic tape for this. I used electrical tape before for masking, but that was melting and deforming pretty much due to the heat and its elasticity. So I hope this plastic tape works a bit better here. Okay, after engraving all of the parts, I remove the inner cutouts by using an X-Acto knife. This works well with the steel, but I am just about to bump in the exact same problem I was just talking about. The steel is thick and has a lot of more mass than the thin copper and brass sheet, um, so they heat up much much quicker. So quick that they actually have deformed um, the plastic tape as you can see on these pictures here. This is not going to work. I heard of using nail polish, but I will try it with some regular paper masking tape. So masking off everything again and um, back to the laser. Now this looks much better. The cuts are crisp and clean. Let's start electrocuting, uh, I mean uh, elect electrolyzing. The nice thing about electrolyze is that you probably don't even have to leave the house as you have everything you need at home. And here's what you need. Some regular salt, any kind of vinegar, two 9 volt batteries or ideally a bench power supply, a car battery charger works as well, two little alligator clips with some cable on it, a small glass or container and some q-tips. Take a good amount of salt and some vinegar, it should be a pretty rich mixture. Mix everything together until the salt is dissolved. Now 
unhook up the red alligator clip to the plus terminal of your battery or power source and connect it to your working piece. Dip one of the Q-tips into the salt and vinegar solution and then um, clip on the white alligator clip that connects to the negative terminal. Now start to speckle over the exposed metal surface. Take your time of doing this. I'll take about 5 minutes per plate. As soon as I touch the surface it starts sizzling and after 3 to 4 seconds you can see some bubbles and fumes forming. Electrolysis is the interchange of atoms and ions by removal or additions of electrons from the external power circuit such as our battery for example. In our case, when the carbonate ions of the salt and water mixture touches the metal surface, what also is the anode in this case, at least one of two things is possible. Either the iron or metal absorbs the electrons from the carbonate ions and forms iron carbonate, or the hydroxide ion of the dissolved water molecules release electrons. In this case, iron hydroxide is formed. Iron hydroxide immediately breaks down into iron oxide and water. The iron oxide is this reddish stuff um, that forms on the tip of your Q-tip. As we are using regular kitchen salt, there is chlorine gas forming, what is highly toxic. So don't breathe the fumes and do this at a good ventilated spot. Now I wash every plate under running water, unwrapping them, Then I rub off the remaining glue with some rubbing alcohol. And well, it worked somehow, but uh, the masking tape is not working at all. So as I already thought. Look at the carbon steel that I had masked with the plastic tape. It had etched perfectly. Nice and crisp contours and you can even feel the engravement when you uh, scratch with your fingernail over it. As a conclusion, I think the right way to go here is to use a thick steel plate as an underlay when working with thin materials to disperse the heat evenly and quick to avoid the plastic film from deforming too much. The electrolysis works great, easy and uh, fairly quick. The result on the steel is definitely permanent and deep enough to withstand a long time even at the outdoors. And with some more exercise I should be soon able to make proper engravings on metal by using my K40 laser and the power of physics. Alright, I hope this uh, was a little informative and not too much of a boring chemistry and physics lesson. I am about to see if I will get me a better camera soon, um, one with some optical zoom and with a macro lens. So sorry for the unsharp shots, I really can't do anything about that at this point. I hope you enjoyed, if so please uh, give me a thumbs up and share, engrave me a comment below and subscribe to my channel for more to come. Until then, see ya!